Welcome back to The Fuse Show, everybody. I'm joined today by my guest, Manon Kerma. Manon has been a mathematics educator since his college days. He founded Locus Education upon graduating from IIT Delhi in 2007. He trained over 10,000 students within the first few years of his career as an educator. This experience of teaching JEE aspirants helped him gain insight into how the country's youth perceives and studies math. In 2013, he founded QMath, which is an engaging platform that helps children master and fall in love with math. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jim, and uh, lovely to be here and speaking with you. So let's let's jump right into this. Tell tell us what QMath is and the audience that you serve and what you guys do. So, Jim, the idea with QMath is, um, you know, very simple but very ambitious. Math is something that most kids dread. You know, they feel very anxious about math. But in today's world, math is becoming more and more of a life skill uh, than just a subject to be done at school. You know, if you look at how the economy is shaping up, if you look at what kind of jobs are becoming more valuable, you know, product managers, engineers, you know, data scientists, and so on and so forth, right? You see that ultimately a lot of the most valuable careers of tomorrow's economy will have math uh, at their core. Uh, but the way math is taught to children today is is based on a lot of rote memorization, on a lot of you know, just, just mindless kind of repetition and so on, right? So our goal with QMath is to get kids to learn math as a life skill, almost like a second language. You know, our goal with QMath is to see, make kids see that math underlies everything around them. For example, COVID, right? So um, the spread of COVID is actually an exponential uh, behavior, uh, you know, that you can model with mathematics and so on, right? So Kids should be able to, kids who have learned exponents in school should be able to kind of correlate that with, okay, you know, this is what's happening uh, in the world around us and so on. But that rarely happens. What kids learn in the name of math in school, they hardly ever connect it to their, uh, you know, life outside. And that's actually quite a, quite, uh, quite unfortunate. So our goal with QMath is to make sure that kids learn math the right way. They learn it as a language. They see that it underlies everything around them. And ultimately, they end up becoming very, very strong uh, you know, problem solvers because of that mathematical thinking that they have inculcated. So that's the that's our goal with QMath. And th- the way we do this, uh, Jim, is we have a live class platform where our teachers uh, te- run math classes, you know, live one-to-one online math classes, you know, with, with kids who, who, who've enrolled for the QMath program. And uh, we today we have students coming from all over the world and we have more than 10,000 tutors on the platform. So that's essentially what we do. Wow, that's exceptional. And I heard that you're expanding into the U.S., is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, last year in 2020, before 2020, we were uh, mostly India-centric. But in 2020, especially when the COVID, the first wave of COVID started, we, uh, you know, started going, um, we started expanding to countries, markets outside India. And U.S. was, uh, you know, one of the first ones. And immediately right off the bat, we we found very strong traction. We found very strong feedback, you know, coming in from parents in the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, the way we do math is very visual. It's very fun. You know, kids really like the approach and so on. And that enabled us to scale very, very rapidly in the U.S. market. So today, U.S., interestingly, we started seven years ago. But in just one year of operations, U.S. accounts for most of our revenue today. So it's been a very interesting uh, 12 months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. You know, it, it's yeah. so weird. Like, I, I know that a, a lot of businesses done, have done well during COVID. And mm-hmm. it sounds like you guys have. We have on, on our site as well. But it's like, I, I feel so tender for the people that have struggled with COVID, obviously lost their lives and then lost their careers, et cetera. But it's like, it's just, it's been such a weird thing, you know, that, that mm-hmm. uh, this disease can be devastating for some and, and really good for others. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually quite weird, right? Uh, Throughout the COVID wave, you know, and, and this was uh, in India, the COVID wave started mid of March of 2020. And uh, it was actually a pretty weird feeling, right? On the one hand, your business starts scaling really rapidly and, you know, you start seeing demand from all over the place. But on the other side, you see this macro situation where, you know, so many people are getting ill. And uh, India was especially, you know, very badly hit, especially in the second wave. And, you know, man- many of my own family members went through it and so on. So it was actually mm-hmm. pretty pretty weird mix, very, very uh, strange times, you know, um, these, these last few months. But from a business point of view, obviously, we have scaled quite well. Yeah. Well, good for you guys. I, so <laughs> I'm curious. I, I have five kids, and a couple of them really enjoy math. But one of my daughters is just, 
she struggles with it. And she just, like, to your point, she doesn't understand the why. And she thinks mm-hmm. it's stupid that she has to memorize all of the what. So like what, and she's mm-hmm. 14. What's mm-hmm. your, what's your advice to parents to kind of change our kids paradigm on math and, and, and help them to love the concept of it versus just, you know, being turned off to it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, math, firstly, I think a lot of parents um, think of math as just another subject that their kids need to excel at in school, you know, and maybe score, uh, you know, do well on the next test coming up and so on. But actually, parents also need to take a step back and realize that math is much more, you know, it's like, you know, we get we get very, um, for example, we get very um, worried if our kids or if kids around us, you know, if someone is not able to speak a language properly, right? But we don't have the same reaction when it comes to someone struggling with math. We say, okay, you know, this person is not math minded, maybe, you know, and that's why they're struggling with math. But actually, there's no such thing. Actually, every kid across the world naturally is wired to excel at math, to be really, really good at math. You know, math is just like language. Uh, and if taught well, uh, every kid can excel at it, right? So so if if a child today, like you said, your daughter, right, she's 14 years, I'm presuming she must be grade 9 or grade 10. Um, if she's Pretty struggling nice. today with math, yeah, if she's struggling today with math, right, it's not really her fault. Um, you know, intrinsically, she may be really, really capable of very strong logical thinking, you know, very strong mathematical thinking. But they, the way she was taught, you know, through her schooling years, um, you know, teachers may have focused a lot on memorization, on rote learning and so on. And somewhere through that journey, she may have built that aversion to math, you know. And mo- many kids uh, go through this kind of journey. I've taught thousands of kids. Uh, and I see kids who are otherwise, you know, very, very talented, kind of struggling with something as basic as school math. It should not happen. It's actually quite disastrous, you know, that that this is the situation, especially in today's age, you know, where I actually think math should yeah. be fundamental right now. And every kid should be excelling at it. And it's our job as adults and educators and, you know, the system to make sure that happens. But I think parents also need to understand this, that, uh, okay, math is a life skill. It's a language. Uh, you know, you need to you need to make sure that your kid is getting the right kind of support, the right kind of inputs, the right kind of teachers. Um, you know, and in some cases, for example, we as a business platform can come in and you know help in, in a few of those cases. But ultimately, the gravity of math as a life skill needs to be realized by parents. I think. Yeah. Yeah, that is what I was <laughs> what I would say. I, I'm going to go home and tell Grace, like, Grace, I met this guy, Manon, from QMath. Like, you don't have to be miserable with math anymore. There's a different way to do this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. My wife, um, you know, she is, sometimes tells me that, uh, you know, she's struggled with math. and But I, I, I've found that she's otherwise really, really strong at logical puzzles, you know. So I was asking her one day, why are you scared? Why, why are you anxious around numbers? And why are you anxious around, you know, mathematical stuff? And she just said, look, you know, at till a certain point in school, I used to do well. But then there was this teacher who came in and who said, look, you know, you have to do it this way. There's no other way to think. And you have to score, you know, uh, this this much score and so on and so forth. And that's where I started fearing the subject, right? And this happens with a lot of kids. And a lot of kids at some point, may they may, uh, you know, get a bad teacher or they, you know, they, they just pick up, become part of a system where the focus was a lot more on rote learning instead of actually understanding. And that's where the ball starts to drop. It's actually the... You know, yeah. I often tell parents and I often tell others that if a kid is struggling with the subject, if a kid kid is struggling with math, actually the everyone else is to blame except the kid. You know, yeah, it's never the kid's fault. Yeah, I, I, I watched your TED talk and one of the things you said there was uh, the blackboard is the villain. It's an obsolete learning model that represents the what over the why. Like, I, yeah. I like that because I think we're quick to point fingers at individuals you know, versus just the, the entire, you know, paradigm that we have around the way that, that students are educated in math. Yeah, absolutely. The Blackboard learning model was set up in when the industrial age was just setting in and, you know, industries needed workers, uh, you know, and, you know, people who could do specific things in volume, right? Um, but that's no longer the case today. We don't need to fill our factories and stuff like that. We need people who are original problem solvers, original thinkers and so on. So the bra- Blackboard model essentially... Yeah. When I did that TED talk, what I essentially meant by the Blackboard model was, uh, you know, the, the the whole model is around the teacher kind of lecturing and broadcasting and, you know, speaking all the time. And students just passively mm-hmm. uh, sitting and listening to what the teacher is saying, right? And the analogy I often use is, you know, it's almost like, you know, you go, you sign up for a swimming class and 
you want to learn swimming but the way the swimming school teaches you swimming is that the coach jumps into the pool and starts swimming and says okay you know watch me and learn how to swim but you know never going to learn swimming that way right? you actually have to jump yourself into the pool and uh, you know make make those strokes and so on uh, and that's how you learn right so it's the same with math you have to do math to learn math there's no other way and the blackboard model does not lend itself to that it's it's very passive it's very second hand you know um and uh, at qmath what we try to do is essentially is you know kids solve problems and many of them are linked to real world context so they solve problems most of the time and the teacher acts like uh, more like you know a coach and a facilitator and steps in only when a student gets stuck and you know they need to move forward and they need some kind of help so it's a very very different kind of learning model compared to the traditional blackboard mm-hmm. model yeah i i love hearing your passion about this and I, i'm thinking of like the the at least in the United States, and this is probably true other places, the, the education system is like this huge, heavy freight train that's barreling down the tracks, going the wrong direction. It's like, mm-hmm. obviously, you guys are starting to make a dent in, in mm-hmm. the, the methodology of the way that people teach math. But like, what does it take to, to provoke a systemic change so you can, can change this on a, a much larger scale where we literally change the way that, at least in the United States and hopefully other areas, the way that we teach math for our kids? Yeah, so I have this very strong belief that systemic change will not come from within the system. So if if uh, you know I've worked with um, you know lots of teachers, educators, you know policymakers, and so on, and uh, everyone's well intentioned, but this system, this legacy system, has just has so much inertia that it's really hard you know uh, to kind of you know change directions, right? Um, what I think will happen is as you know, as the economy shapes up um, in in this century, and as new and new kind of jobs come up, and new and new skills become more and more valuable, right? Um, it, it'll almost be like a different kind of uh, you know, a different set of skills that will become more valuable, and the traditional system of education will almost become obsolete. So, case in point being, for example, uh, today in uh, technology hiring, right? We no longer I run a company of a thousand people, you know, and uh, there are close to a hundred engineers in the company, right? And when we do technology hiring, we no longer look for, you know, folks who've come through the traditional, you know, system of let's say twelve years of school and then four years of college and so on. Right? We are looking today for people who have very, very strong problem-solving skills, whether they have done an undergraduate degree or not, whether they have, you know, done even grade twelve or not, does not matter to us anymore. Um, you know, Google has uh, said recently that. They'll hire folks who have that, you know, three hundred dollar online degree, and you know, folks don't even need to go to college, um, you know, to to get into Google, right? So, when when the when from an economic pressure point of view, when these things start to kick in, right? Parents and you know, in general, um, the education system and so on will start to realize that the traditional system is no longer valuable. I mean, forget forget uh, changing it; it's not even valuable. It's become obsolete, right? And uh, then you will see massive disruption happening exponentially. That's that's my hypothesis. I think the current system is just. I think schools will ultimately evolve into you know places where kids socialize with their kids and you know build their social skills. But learning will happen mm-hmm. um, you know through many other channels and many other avenues, and not primarily through the schooling system. Wow, it's, it's fascinating to hear you say that. I, it's interesting, especially I, I've heard of this idea in sort of like non-technical fields. Like to give you an example, about, I don't know, five years ago or so, I, I applied to a job and ended up getting the job as a effectively a manager of an e-commerce business. And I, mm-hmm. I took, I have some hours towards my MBA and I took that off of my resume mm-hmm. because I knew that at least with this owner that hired me, it was a, ter- a deterrent, it was a negative. And I actually previously mm-hmm. stopped my MBA program. Now, I'm not saying this is true for all programs, but the one where I was, you know, I was taking a, a, a class on online marketing and it was mm-hmm. taught by someone that had never owned a business and the stuff we were learning in the book was outdated. Mm-hmm. It was archaic. Mm-hmm. So I had to go to YouTube to actually mm-hmm. learn what I needed to, to then apply it. It's just like, mm-hmm. but I don't know, that was a paradigm shift to me in terms of education and my my grandparents, uh, mm-hmm. you know, her World War II generation are extremely mm-hmm. pro education, but the world mm-hmm. has changed. And to your point, mm-hmm. I, the system is not changing quick enough to adapt yeah. to that yeah yeah so the the system is still moving at a glacial linear pace but the change you know around us is exponential and you know the the single most important fact about exponential behavior is at any point you know you try to project out but the behavior is changing much faster right so if you really do the math here you know you mm. you see that 
the traditional system will will become completely obsolete and i'm not even talking at a decade kind of scale right i'm i'm talking about 5 years from now um well, it no longer matters to us you know that uh, you know the person who trying to hire comes from you know the top most organization or you know some has some stellar pedigree and so on what we're looking for is skills what we're looking for is real knowledge you know one of my best engineers um uh you know who came in at at like a really really um you know entry level kind of position had no formal education um, no formal proper education right but learned on the go but was a really good thinker and problem mm-hmm. solver ultimately within our own company he saw 20x 20x jump in uh, compensation you know from his initial uh, number and then he moved on to where, where yeah where he got a further you know 2x kind of uh, jump from where he was right so so i'm actually seeing this happen right in front of my eyes where you know traditional schooling and traditional education is no longer uh, will no longer command the kind of premium it used to you know just a few years back so so and that that pressure of change will start percolating down and parents will start realizing that you know what their kids need is not you know just some um, fancy degree or you know just some you know scores in school exams and tests which have no meaning but they need real skills you know which will which will make them employable and i think yeah. that is what will drive the change rather than some systemic policy you know changes driven by the government and so on because i don't think that's going to happen i think it's like not possible <laughs> in my opinion <laughs> you're well, certainly not likely yeah that's for sure <laughs> you know yeah. th- this this makes me think of another challenge and that is employers figuring i mean it used to be and i recognize a lot of them still do where it's like oh this person has this degree in x we check the box you know they have maybe 2 years of positive work experience great let's bring them on but now to your point that's not as meaningful so we as employers have to to fix the way that we're hiring so how do you yeah. look at that i mean without you know divulging anything that's proprietary but it's like is it a matter of evaluating skills is this in the interview is it testing that you get like how do you find these problem solving skills yeah so as you said rightly said right it's all about problem solving ability and um, so depending on what role you're hiring for whether you're hiring for engineering or product design or whether you're hiring for sales you know or uh, business development and so on what you're lo- looking for is a person who can solve a new and original problem you know in a, in a, in a, in a in a way that's not been done before for example because everything else is anyways getting automated right for example something you know as considered to be as complex as performance marketing uh, you know digital marketing right now you have engines that optimize uh, you know campaigns in real time basis data and so on right and you no longer need people who are just doing that you need people who have a far higher order of thinking saying okay you know what is the value proposition what is the consumer context how are they thinking and so on right so what you're testing for is the person's ability to look at a situation deconstruct it uh, figure out what the levers in the situation are and then say okay you know if i do this th- this is what is going to happen if i do this this is what is going to happen right so it's classic algorithmic thinking it's classic mathematical thinking and i think one of the best ways to build this problem solving ability is to give kid uh, give kids a very strong foundation in math from a very young age so that's like essentially what we're trying to do right we're saying okay right from kindergarten onward if kids solve problems you know in in new and different contexts in real world situations and so on they'll end up becoming very very strong you know the word we use is invincible invincible problem solvers no matter what you throw at them no matter what kind of situation you put them in they will come up with something you know they they'll be able to um, kind of break through it right so yeah. that is essentially our mission yeah you know the the way we kind of articulate our mission is one billion math minds you know can we create can we touch every you know kid across the world and you know turn them into mathematical thinker right because suddenly uh, if that happens it's almost like you upgrade humanity you know in, in a way right so so yeah. yeah it's like yeah yeah you're really teaching kids how to think absolutely yeah you're teaching kids how to think you're teaching kids how to process you know everything around them so yeah that's math for us not the stuff that kids do in school yeah right i, I want to reverse engineer your success a little bit i mean you've been at this for almost 8 years with q math 1000 employees you guys have been very successful what's the What's the secret sauce there, right? Like I I can see your passion and I can hear your passion is is that and I know it's not one thing, but but what are some of the ingredients that have led to your success to this point? I think um from day one one thing that we've really, you know, stressed upon is learning outcomes, you know, making sure that, you know, kids who are coming to QMath 
uh, you know for our math classes they actually end up doing well um, you know and they actually meet the learning goals and we have very kind of rigorous processes uh, in how we measure whether learning outcomes are happening or not uh, so for example more than 90% of our parents uh, where children have spent you know 6 months or more in the system they basically say that okay you know my kid was um, was indifferent or averse to math you know but now enjoys it and so on so so we, we track a lot of these metrics to see whether kids are actually improving or not so that's 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 one thing that that really drives our growth and word of mouth you know half of our new student additions are via referrals you know which is uh, almost like a record number um so so that's one thing i think the other thing is um, you know just making sure that the product you know this is this is basically like a, a challenge that's kind of unique to edtech right um, and you know edtech as you know is like suddenly become like the super hot industry lots of capital flowing into uh, you know in, into the space and so on but i think the real challenge yeah. of the edtech space is as you scale to millions of learners how do you make sure at the same time that you know each learner um, actually benefits from what you're offering how do you make sure that your system adapts at scale personalizes at scale right uh, so it's a very different problem with you know pharma for example you make one drug and that drug will work you know across the board or almost across the board but it's not the same with edtech you know you create a learning solution that static and that's one size fits all it's not going to work you know for millions of students you have to make because if if there's a billion students in the world there's a billion different ways of learning um and you have to make sure that you build systems mm-hmm. that adapt to different kinds of learners right so that's one thing that we have kind of you know worked on uh, quite deeply and we've been able to do it to some extent you know if a student is struggling for example they'll get a different learning path if a student is excelling they'll get a different learning path and so on so that's really driven that whole mm-hmm. learning outcomes bit um uh, but i think if you're able to solve that ultimately to its fullest extent that's basically cracking the holy grail of education and we i think everyone including us we still a long way off from that stage but yeah i think the obsessive focus on learning outcomes has uh, has helped us scale to where we are today i want to know more though manon about you as a founder what what has made you successful what what's your secret sauce i mean this is no small feat and I mean, heck, even yeah. to stick with the business for almost eight years is significant. Obviously, any business that survives and let alone thrives in eight years has faced a tremendous amount of challenges. So what yeah. what's the key to your success as a founder? Yeah, I think the, you know, and um, often new entrepreneurs ask me this question on, you know, uh, okay, what would I advise? What advice would I give them? Um, I think the first thing is you really need to be passionate about the space that you're building the business in uh, because, you know, from the outside entrepreneurship may look you know very sexy and very exciting but every day you have to wake up and you know it's like you have to fight a battle right um, and there'll be lots yeah. of ups and downs and uh, there'll be days where you're like okay you know why am i even doing this and so on right but if you're passionate about the problem and if you're passionate about the space and what you're doing uh, it it just uh, it just puts the it it, it just basically um, eases the journey you know to a very large extent you know even if you're going through a struggling phase right so that's one thing um i think the second thing is you have to realize that uh, you know just like every good thing in life this is about you know success at entrepreneurship is about perseverance and the power of compounding and what i mean by that is you know there's no there's not going to be overnight success you know you you keep kind of once you identify the right direction you keep executing you keep building and so on but ultimately compounding will start to happen at some point and compounding i believe is the most powerful force in the universe right um yeah. it's like if you, if if you if you get it right if you have the if you have a good team if you have the right space you know and if you if you're executing well there's no reason why you can't build a massive business so i think that's the um uh, second thing that's i think third you, yeah yeah i think the the third thing is you have to have the you have to have a good evaluation of your competence and also you have to wherever you are not competent as a, as a founder as an entrepreneur you have to make sure that you have the right team to kind of support you uh, to do that um you know so my strength for example is um you know building great products uh but there are many people on my team who actually are great at business execution you know and marketing and you know, stuff like that you know which i'm not great at um so once you once you have a stellar team in place you know kind of uh, i mean the whole journey uh, gets accelerated so i think it's these three or four things you know passion for the space perseverance and compounding mindset having the right team um that ultimately adds up to you know really massive gains but yeah it's been a so it's, it's, it's been a journey of ups and downs yeah as you said <laughs> i'm sure 
So that's, I, I, I think what I hear you saying is the, the passion is what fuels you past the challenges, right? Like when you have a really crappy day or a string of crappy days, it's, it's your passion that propels you through the problem. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Because there will be times through the journey when you will hit a wall uh, and that's almost like a given, you know, you will definitely hit a wall at some point, you know, there will be, um, uh, you know, phases where your current strategy will plateau and, you know, you'll, you'll need to figure out, you know, new ways to grow and so on. Um, and, but if you're passionate about the problem, in my case, I know what I'm solving for and what I'm solving for is making millions of kids, you know, around the world, you know, turning them into better thinkers, right? And that excites me every day. And every day when I hear a success story and, you know, some parent will come in and say, you know, look, uh, you changed my kid's life or some kid will come in and say, look, you know, now, now I just feel much better about myself and my whole self-esteem has gone up, you know, because uh, I've become skilled at this yeah. thing where I thought, you know, um, I was I was not competent and so on, right? It just gives you that satisfaction, you know, as you, as you do that. And that fuels and drives a lot of your ambition and your uh, excitement. So if you're passionate about this space, I think it's it's much easier to stick with the journey. If you're just jumping into a space because it's hot right now, you know, it's it's the trend right now, um, you, you're not going to, compounding won't happen. You know, you're not going to stick. And ultimately mm -hmm. you will exit with, with suboptimal yeah. Gains, uh, gains. Yeah. So are you, are you a teacher first or a founder first? I'm a teacher at heart. Both my parents are university <laughs> professors. And, uh, yeah, your dad's my, a chemistry professor, right? Yeah, yeah my dad is a mm. chemistry professor. My mom is a biologist, and uh, both of them are PhDs. And you know, when I graduated from um, college, and that I had a bachelor's degree, and I started teaching right out of college, you know, and st uh, started in my journey into this education space, um, they were not very happy. You know, they wanted me to do a PhD and so on because they thought. You know, you at least you need to at least have a PhD, <laughs> you know, to um, to be considered like really educated and so on. Uh, but now, of course, uh, they're pretty happy. Uh, but yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure I, they are. <laughs> I have uh, math is something I've always enjoyed uh, since I was a young kid, and uh, I've I've been attracted to teaching because both my parents are teachers, um, and I've seen the power of a great teacher. You know in my own life, but I've also been able to impact the lives of, you know, hundreds of kids, if not more, you uh, know, in, in a very meaningful way. If you find the right teacher at the right time in your life, it just completely changes your life's trajectory. Um, so, so I'm a teacher first, yeah, does. Um, sure. a founder second and a CEO third, right? So that's how I think about my, um, yeah, my role. You, you know, a theme that I've been thinking a lot about lately is this idea of, of replicating myself. And so what I'm getting at is there are many teachers in the world that are dynamic and amazing individual contributors, right? They teach in a, in a way that's outstanding and is captivating and all of those things. But there are a few like you that have learned how to expand on that, how to leverage your passion, abilities, et cetera, to grow something that has impacted, well, on the way to a, a billion or more kids. Like that's, mm -hmm. did you have a turning point where you're like, I've got to do something. And I don't mean this in a way that's like, um, you know, denigrating it all to teachers, but like, did you have a, a moment where you're like, I've got to do something more than this? You know, like, I'm sure you were enjoying being a teacher, but like, did you have a moment where you're like, I, 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 there's just something more I need to do? Absolutely. Um, you know, I remember, uh, you know, my days right before QMath, um, and actually before that as well, when I used to teach and, um, uh, you know, some of the things that I used to do with my students just made their learning so much more easier and so much more fun. Uh, but then when I would meet, you know, some other students elsewhere, you know, who were learning in, you know, very traditional ways and so on, I would just see this huge, um, you know, gap. And I would see, okay, you know, a student mm -hmm. with, you know, with, with very strong intrinsic capabilities is struggling not because of any fault of theirs, but because of the kind of inputs and teaching that they're getting at that point, right? And, you know, that kind of yeah. started, and that's the reason why I, uh, you know, QMath is actually my second business. My first business was actually, you know, uh, a, a traditional teaching setup, uh, you know, where I started teaching, right? And that's why I exited my first business because I thought, look, I have a certain way of thinking about how math should be taught, um, you know, and uh, can we replicate it 
to millions of students you know tens of millions of students can we create systems and tools that will you know scale the impact from what i was doing at that point which was maybe a few hundred students every year to millions of students every year right and that was the genesis of the qman mm-hmm. idea uh, essentially right that can you build a learning system uh, still driven by a teacher but um, you know the teacher is equipped with the right kind of tools the right kind of frameworks um, you know to make to make sure that each student gets the uh, the the right kind of inputs you know and they, and um, um and you know and, and they're not put into a situation where for no fault of theirs you know they they end up struggling with the subject right so definitely there was a turning point um i remember one of those vividly when i met one of my own nephews you know after after maybe a year and a half and um, in in that span of a year and a half he'd gone from someone who really enjoyed math and who really excelled at it uh, to someone who just said math is not for me you know and um, mm-hmm. uh, i'm really poor at math and you know i i want to take up a career where there's no math involved and i asked him what happened you know you, you used to you used to enjoy it so much you used to do puzzles with me and so on right and he said no no but in the last one year this happened that happened you know when i probed him further i realized that it was actually a situation where he'd he'd gotten a new teacher and the teacher was not skilled you know the teacher had uh, no clue on how to teach and so on and that teacher had this kind of an impact on you know the uh, the kid right who who otherwise would have gone on to do really great things and this what i'm describing you know as one story is actually a story that plays out every day with millions of kids um so it's actually quite unfortunate but yeah so th- these small stories in my own life have been turning points and have basically excited me and you know prompted me to uh, you know build learning systems at scale where every kid gets the right kind of inputs yeah That's so awesome. I really love hearing your passion about this. It's contagious. <laughs> uh, you know, I want to ask you, so you, you mentioned a second ago that you're a teacher first, then a founder, then a CEO. I mean, yeah. a, a thousand employees is no small number. How have yeah. you handled your own upskilling to where you're, you're prepared to lead a company? I, I see two different paths. I'm sure there's more than two, but I often see two different paths. Either the, the founder upskills themselves to get to the point where they can can lead at that level else they hire somebody that has the experience to lead at right. that level what what path have you taken and how's that gone i think it's a combination of both jim uh, partly it's just been um, you know self upskilling you know you talk to folks outside you read the right kind of books and so on and if you're a founder you also are connected to a lot of other founders who are going through you know similar journeys and some mm-hmm. of them are uh, you know ahead of you some of them are behind you but you get a learn a lot from that cohort um and being a founder your upskilling journey is uh, easily i would say 10x faster um you know than what it would be otherwise um, because you just th- there's so much at stake and you know it's such a high stakes game that margin for error is very less um so you have to really really upskill yourself obviously so partly it's been that uh, and you know if i compare my mindset today my competence today around doing things you know versus uh, what these used to be maybe even you know two years back or three years back i think there's a non linear jump every year you know in your ability to you know kind of run an organization deal with people and so on right so partly it's been self upskilling partly it's also about building the right kind of team and you know getting the right kind of people on board um i have found that um you know if you find for any function or any kind of uh, you know business unit that you want to drive if you invest a lot of time in finding the right person to run it um the gains ultimately are non linear you know there's like huge compounding that happens um you know you don't it's yeah. almost like you know that problem is solved uh, and you don't have to you know uh, spend operational bandwidth on a, on a day to day basis so partly this game you know this effort of run, building an org and scaling it is about making sure that the right people are you know positioned at the right places so it's about your own upskilling as well but it's also about this i think both have to happen both things have to come together uh, if you want to you know build an org if you want to build an institute institution you know that thrives and sustains and is not just there for the short term so i think it's and it's no easy feat it's a lot of hard work uh, you know you make mistakes also at times uh, but you learn and you kind of continue to move forward yeah yeah that's awesome well manan i know we need to land this plane i i'm so appreciative of your your sharing of of your time you've been so gracious with that and in your wisdom as well um so i i've got to ask you so when can we expect 
Q math to reach a billion children. When, when's the when's the deadline for that? <laughs> yeah, so that's a very interesting question, Jim. Um, I think um, more than that, I think we'll get there. I'm pretty confident we'll get there. But I think more than that, I want to make sure that every kid who comes onto the QMath platform um, ultimately ends up benefiting in some way. You know, I was telling one of my friends yesterday that, um, you know, in, in, in math, one of the biggest achievements is winning a Fields Medal, uh, you know, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Science. And, you know, mm. I was just telling my friend, um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the day when one of one, a QMath kid goes on to win the Fields Medal. Uh, you know, that'll be like really awesome. So I think it's 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 more about the journey than any end goal. I think the journey is very exciting. You know, as you as you get more kids into the ecosystem and you see them, you see them yeah. thriving and doing well. I think that's the, what keeps propelling. And if you keep at it, ultimately you will reach your milestone. So maybe it's five years, maybe it's eight years, uh, maybe it's ten years. But uh, I think we will get there. And it, you know, if you're going to do a billion, you may as well go over two, three, or four, or five billion. You know. <laughs> start start reaching adults and everybody. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Manon, thank you so much. We'll be sharing the the link to QMath, which is QMath.com. It's C-U-E math.com. Uh, you can book a free class there. We'll also post the link to your LinkedIn. Um, I really appreciate your time. You're, you're a very passionate guy. I know you're a busy guy as well. So I, I feel like it's just such a privilege to have an opportunity to, to speak with you for 30, 30 plus minutes. So thank you. It's been my, my pleasure as well, Jim. Uh, I think it was lovely chatting with you and talking about all of this. Awesome. Well, get some rest. I know it's getting late there in India. So thanks again for your time. Thank you, Jim. Thanks a lot.